Welcome everyone to our latest seminar on pressing your art with Krista Senna. Thank you, Krista. I'll hand off to you. Thank you everyone that's joining us. Let's dive right in and go to the first slide. As Jack said, um, I'm gonna go through the presentation. I wanna give you a lot of info. Uh, a couple areas of the presentation will be interactive, but for the most part, I am an independent curator. I've been curating since about 2008. And then I started to advise new art buyers. I use that term intentionally. Um, I started to advise new art buyers when I opened my gallery with my business and community partner, Jill Benson in 2013. Um, these were people who were buying art for the first time and making their first major art investment and wanted someone to help guide them in a murky art world. So I also work as a artist coach, artist advisor. So that art advisor label is two pronged. So I work with the client side as I did when I had my gallery. And then I continue to work with artists uh, more as a professional development coach in a freelance capacity. Since I closed my gallery, I was art consulting, working in this artist coach capacity with an organization called Ninth Street Collective. They're a wonderful professional development service uh, company that connects artist coaches and art advisors like myself with organizations and artists like you all to cover a whole range of topics. Most recently in the past year, it's actually coming up on a year in late October, I went back to work full-time for an arts organization called Glass Roots. Glass Roots is a nonprofit glass art studio located in Newark, New Jersey. And we teach life skills to teenagers and young adults through the transformative potential and power of glass art. So that is what I'm up to these days. But what brings me to this uh, discussion is really my work with the clients and with the gallery from 2013 to 2020, when I was constantly looking at artwork and pricing artwork and working with artists on pricing their artwork for gallery exhibitions, art fairs, and even studio sales, as I'm sure some of you may be familiar with. All right. so. When we're thinking about pricing and you're putting your work in that public domain, whether it's an exhibition, an art fair, or an online site like Artsy, or even your own website, right? We have to keep in mind that pricing does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, pricing is not fully personal. It's very practical. Some personal elements go into it. Text is really what drives how you think about your pricing because your work is not being evaluated just in isolation. Like many things in the art world, um, you're viewing, you, you as an artist are being viewed by the gallery and other collectors, potential collectors, in the context of other artists in your domain, in the context of other artwork that that gallery has shown, will be showing, is considering showing, and also a host of other variables that the gallery has to consider when working with you on this uh, magical pricing formula. It's difficult for all involved, it's awkward, but you start to get the hang of it the more you do it and your gallery partner really is a partner in this context. The gallery owner has a lot to share and typically is very open to sharing those tips and helping you arrive at a price that you can feel comfortable with as an exhibiting artist. All right, so what are these variables that gallery owners like myself consider? Your market and your mindset. So I'm actually gonna jump to mindset because it's arguably more important. Uh, you have to know as an artist that you're truly ready to part with um, the particular piece that you'd like to sell. Not theoretically, but that if someone is really interested in it and, and you and the gallery go through the hard work of pricing it, that it can actually be sold and um, you know, will no longer be in your possession. That might sound silly, but I had two incidents uh, that I learned from earlier on in my career as a younger, uh, less experienced gallery owner, where um, 
we didn't even get to the sale because the artists in both cases uh, weren't really committed to selling that work. So one thing about uh, pricing and selling is that you have to have the mindset to, you know, embrace the fact that this could happen. Another thing that galleries are always thinking about, like I just said, are who are your peers in this market? Who are other artists working in your vein and your trajectory? Uh, much like when you're looking for a gallery, right? A lot of artists do a lot of um, research to think about what gallery would I like to show at? Um, what gallery really reflects my values? You know, what gallery shows artists that I feel like I, you know, speak the same language as and can really relate to and resonate with? It's actually similar when you're thinking about uh, pricing. You want to think about, and and the gallery actually thinks about, you know, what works have we sold that are comparable? Obviously, not in terms of their individuality and their meaning, but more in terms of, you know, uh, the genre, prints, paintings, photography. Um, again, the artists that you're working with, that we're working with. And then just as important, galleries think about their clientele, right? We have to be realistic too, right? Like if people come into my gallery and they're used to spending between $200 and $2,000, then, you know, I can't show a work that is, or I can't show many works, let's say, that are $5,000 or $10,000. We can have a couple pieces that reach for the sky because that's important, but you just want to be realistic in terms of, um, how you're pricing this artwork for your context. Because gallery owners really do think, okay, the people that come in here or the people that visit our website or our artsy page, you know, what are they like? What are their profiles? Um, you know, what did they typically spend? What was like my average sale in the past three months, six months to a year? That's really important. And sometimes we're even thinking, you know, there's that couple that we met last month. I actually think they buy something like this. Or there was that gentleman that expressed interest in black and white photography, and that's kind of how you're working. I actually am going to, you know, cultivate that potential buyer. I think that person might be interested in your artwork. So sometimes it really does become that granular. Um, but we all, as galleries and as artists, we have to keep it real. We keep it in perspective. We think about where we are in our grand art ecosystem and let that be our guide, or at least one of our guides. All right, your track record for sales is very important. Sometimes artists will dismiss sales that they've made when they've shown work at a cafe or at a street festival or a more informal context than say a gallery or an art fair. I'm here to say, don't do that. Every sale is a gift, every sale is a lesson, Every sale is a learning experience. Every sale is a, a building block. So galleries will ask you, you know, what's your track record? What sale, 20 sales, 100 sales, that's excellent. Gives us something to go on because that tells us um, what the market and what the client have started to dictate in terms of how your work is valued in a monetary sense. So we will ask, you know, what's your recent sale? your most recent sale. Tell us more about that sale. Where was it? Who bought it? Um, was the client amenable to that price? Did they try to, you know, haggle you for a discount? Did they buy more than one piece? We'll work with you to get all the information that we can to come to this price. Because data, no matter where the sale happens, the fact that it happened is what's most important. And it really is the best teacher and lets us know, okay, it seems like this is the range where we should price this work based on your personal experience as an artist and based on what I'm seeing in the, the broader trajectory as a gallery owner that's always looking at art, always looking at prices, always selling or at least trying to sell. You know, helps us identify that sweet spot. Next, of course, is commission. So as I think many of you know and have probably experienced, in a traditional gallery model and gallery setting, the gallery owner will take 50% of the final price of the artwork, and then the artist takes 50% of that price. So there's a 50-50 split. Um, typically, that's justified because the gallery is paying rent and operating the infrastructure of a physical space. And also, you know, that infrastructure is costly. Not only are they paying rent, but they're paying for labor to help make the 
exhibition and the sale come to fruition. Um, we're paying for marketing expenses, event expenses, you know, everything that goes into making an exhibition happen or the environment for a sale happen. When you're working with an art advisor or more of a free agent that is not um, uh, affiliated with a particular physical space, typically that commission is less than 50%, and it should be. So that commission is usually 25%, 30%, maybe up to 40 but keep that in mind. It should be under 50 because their costs typically are lower and um, doesn't necessarily justify the 50%. Sometimes galleries will split their commission. So let's say you're showing with a gallery in Manhattan, uh, one particular piece, you've consigned it for six months, they had an exhibition, the work didn't sell, um, then I'd like to show that same piece at a gallery in Brooklyn, at my gallery in Brooklyn, and I do happen to sell the piece, we all get lucky. What happens in that case is nothing happens to your 50% as the artist, um, but myself and the other gallery will most likely split that commission 50-50, meaning 25% and 25%, since it was a real partnership, and both of us had a stake in making that sale happen. Um, one thing that's aside for another workshop that I talk about with like sales etiquette and working with galleries is don't ever cut out a gallery from a sale if they were the reason that clients, you know, came to you because that will sever a important relationship for the long term and it does not end well and is not worth making that sale if you're not going to loop the gallery back in. I digress. <laughs> the third factor we consider with commission is you know, what do you need as an artist? What do you desire um, for your take home? Um, like truly nuts and bolts stuff, right? Not just like pie in the sky ideas of what you want to sell this piece for or feelings about it truly, but like, you know, this is how much time I spent. This is what this piece means in my broader portfolio. Um, like this is the base case for, for the materials and the cost of these pieces. Um, maybe it needs to be framed. You know, I've definitely uh, taken money out of my gallery commission to put towards framing as like an initial investment to make that piece shine and give it a better chance to sell. So that's also very important with commission. Um, there's the context, but gallery owners do touch base, especially I think in gallery owners like myself that work with emerging artists, you know, underrepresented artists, uh, under the radar mid-career artists, it's we we want to have that conversation. We want to all be on the same page and have a price that we're all comfortable with. Just checking, I didn't miss any important pointers in my notes so far. Okay, we are on track. All right, other things to consider that I forgot about earlier in my gallery career and learned pretty pretty quickly to rectify are these incidentals. All right, so these are, you know, the cost of having art, living with art, buying art that sometimes uh, you forgot to, you forget to include it in your pricing, and then you're trying to do damage control and add it after the fact, and then you're giving the client a different price, a higher price, they lose trust. A lot of pricing is based on trust, so you want to think about these incidentals on the back end before you tack on an official price for the outside world to see. So framing is an expensive cost, right? You're going to decide whether you want to sell that piece or need to sell that piece unframed. Will the gallery or some other source help you cover the framing? Um, and if then guess what? The client will have to cover that. So we'd say, here's the price of the piece unframed. Here's a price with the piece framed. We will oversee the framing, but that expense is not, you know, is not going to be the gallery expense and it's not going to be the artist expense. So that's something we all have to think about. Uh, shipping, you know, that can get you if you don't think about that, especially with online sales. You want to work that shipping price into your into your calculus. Um, that's definitely gotten me as a gallery owner. As a gallery owner, it can also be like a, a bargaining chip. Sometimes if you say, you know what, we'll cover shipping. You want to buy that piece, we'll cover the shipping. 
if it's not too exorbitant and it's not to some um, far flung international destination, <laughs> um, that can also uh, help tip the scale between closing a sale and not. So it's not always a bad thing to have that shipping expense out there as a little variable. Um, galleries also have to pay taxes. In New York City, we have to pay quarterly and also annually. So we learned, that was one of the lessons we learned early on as a young gallery was be vigilant about collecting that tax from each sale from your clients, putting that into your price at the point of sale so that you're not dipping into your profits to then pay taxes uh, after all is said and done. So galleries are really um, savvy about that and include that in the pricing as well. And we make that very transparent with the client, right? Like this is the artwork price, this is the tax, uh, another inst another incidental could be an installation, and that's something you don't need to include in the pricing off the bat, but it's definitely something that you should mention to a client who needs help uh, with that particular part of their art journey, let's say. Point being, these are client expenses that the gallery and you as an artist offload onto the clients. These are not expenses that we are supposed to pay. So in order to facilitate that and to cover our bases, these expenses have to be covered in some way, shape and form or included in our pricing model. All right. The all important discount question. Um, I remember feeling very high and mighty and not, you know, uh, very passionate about discounts when I first started running my gallery. I quickly realized this is something you always have to take into account and plan for. You don't want to be stammering and stuttering at the point of sale. You don't want any awkward moments. And the fact is, no matter what price point you are dealing with, whether you're trying to sell a I don't know, $50 print, $200 print, a $1,000 painting or $5,000 painting. In my experience and in various conversations I've had with gallery owners, you know, people are going to ask for a discount. And, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Oftentimes, they just want to feel like they got a little something special, a little extra recognition, got a little deal. And it's not so much about how much that discount is, just the fact that they were able to get one. So we want to decide as the artist and gallery unit, you know, how much of a discount are we willing to include in our pricing model? You know, what is the minimum minimum? How low will we go? What's the minimum that we want to each um, bring home from the sale and will make us feel comfortable with that sale and not make us have regrets or feel guilty or taken advantage of. And that way it can be a win-win situation. Of course, there's more room for a, a steeper discount when the work is more expensive, you know, 10,000, 20,000, that realm. You, you probably are more open to a, a larger discount at that point. And frankly, you should be because those are higher numbers. Um, with that said, the typical standard discount that I used and that other people recommended to me and I think seems to be somewhat of a standard is about 10%, right? So um, if it's a $200 print or photo, knocking 10% off won't um, affect the pricing and what you take home too much. But you really don't want to go beyond that. I remember, though, with a sale, one of our highest sales that was actually an online sale with an art advisor based in Hong Kong, uh, right around the pandemic or right after the pandemic, they had a budget for like a $30,000 large scale painting. And they asked for a 30% budget from the sales price, which I think was, it was some, I don't remember exactly now, but it was somewhere between 25 and 25,000 and 30,000. And, you know, I went back to the artist and talked about that, explained the context. He was amenable, right? No surprise there. Clearly, I was willing to work with them on that discount. And they just said to us, you know, the discount isn't for discount's sake. It's because we're in Hong Kong, you're in Brooklyn, and we'd actually like to use some of that client's budget to pay for the shipping costs to get this to Hong Kong. And I'm like, you know what? Better you than me. 
that's completely logical and we are happy to work with you. So knocking off a few thousand from the top of a almost $30,000 sale did not hurt anyone in the process. I was happy, the artist was happy, the client was happy, didn't overspend. And we didn't let kind of like principle or a hang up risk us each losing thousands of dollars from this sale. Okay, so those are the main variables. And now we're ready to price our artwork. Um, who knows what ABC stands for in, in sales jargon? Anyone wanna write it in, in the chat? Going once, go, oh, okay, I see, I see. Let me look at my chat here. Okay, oh, these are from before. Okay, new message, let's see. <laughs> Yes, Jack, I love that. We should call it ABP. Yeah, Jack said, always be pricing. I like that. I like that a lot. That's actually what we should transition this to. Um, so that's based on the the uh, sales mantra. That's the word I'm looking for. The classic sales mantra, ABC, always be closing. So, you know, as a gallery owner, running a gallery, trying to cover expenses, um, hopefully make some money, you know, stay open as long as possible. You are pricing to sell. You know, you're not pricing for show. Uh, you really want to have a price that is fair and equitable to all parties involved, but a price that, you know, in the past has um, really made people close that sale and pull the trigger. So ABC, always be closing. And for this workshop, ABP, always be. <laughs> um, with that said, as an artist, you know, you shouldn't have to um, compromise too much on pricing artwork to the point where, you know, it's truly uncomfortable. It feels like you'd be resentful if it sold at that price. That's where the price range comes in. We did this with pretty much every show and it was really the saving grace, right? So most of our artists, especially if they were having a solo exhibition, would create work for the show or create a selection of work for the show that went from very affordable pricing to more higher aspirational pricing. And of course that dictated like the size of the work and the scale of the work in a lot of cases. Some were, you know, small drawings and sketches or prints or small photographs that people could just grab at an opening, you know, for less than $100. Others were, you know, larger scale, real anchor pieces for a particular room that showed the artists, uh, well, range too in terms of skill, in terms of skill and uh, let's say interest, but also in terms of price. So that's one thing to remember. It's really smart to have different bodies of work that can attract different types of clientele because they are priced differently for different budgets. And that way you're really growing a network of clientele. And a lot of those clients will grow with you, you know, as they become more knowledgeable about art, more trusting about how much to spend, um, more open to spending more, they learn more about you. They're learning more about the art world and artists in general. You know, they will follow your trajectory. And as your profile starts to rise, their profile as an art buyer starts to rise too. That takes me to my next point here, which is room to grow is better than room to drop. It's much better if something is a bit underpriced. And let's say you're selling a lot from it in that particular context and you learn, okay, you know what? I can price this a little bit more. Maybe I'm selling too much um, at this price and it's making it a little too accessible, going a little too fast. Let me let me turn uh, turn it up a notch, turn the dial up a notch. Um, or you say, you know, now I've had a show in X number of galleries or X number of group shows, so I can justify, you know, an incremental price range too. And if someone asks me or tries to step to me about your price last year or the year before with this, now you're this, it's like, well, yes, you know, that that time I was showing here, since then I've achieved these accolades, I've shown here X, Y, Z, 
And then that way you're cultivating this collector, cultivating, oh yeah, okay, I see what you mean, great, all right, yeah, you are, you are evolving, you are growing. You don't want to aggressively out the gate overprice something, put yourself out there in the public domain at this super high price where you're not selling anything, you're not able to justify it truly, and then you're having to constantly knock, knock down that price um, and then and then people really kind of like lose trust in your judgment and, uh, you know, just don't feel confident buying your work. So it's much better to start smaller and build as your clientele builds and as your profile builds than to put out an arbitrary high price out there that then you have to dock down. And that's like very visible, very public, not, not a good luck. Um, and also, like I said, uh, erodes trust. Um, another thing to think about with pricing, especially if you do have to price your works at a, sometimes there's no choice, you do have to price your works at a higher price range, is the payment plan. Um, we use these a lot at our gallery. And at the time, there were a couple startups that were partnering with galleries or starting to partner with galleries, and they would manage the payment plan uh, for you. And they would take a small cut from our profit to do that, but it was well worth it because they were making sure that the client on the other end, you know, paid in a timely fashion each month. And we didn't have to take on that labor and like that follow up as a gallery. And the artist was paid from the beginning. And then really it was our commission that was dependent on the payment plan. I was always behind it. I recommend artists do it on their own, whether or not they're working with a gallery, because you can often upsell um, with the payment plan when people know that they can pay in these increments versus having that money up front. Two quick stories. Um, one, I remember selling a pretty uh, major painting from our gallery to a new art buyer who worked at the Guggenheim. So this was someone who knew a lot about art, you know, love the art world, very informed, very educated about contemporary art, um, and had decided that she was going to make this particular purchase or wanted to make this purchase of a, you know, pretty sizable, serious painting and, you know, felt discouraged, was daunted by the price. And, um, you know, ABC always be closing. I remember coming at her with like, well, how about we set up a payment plan? You don't have to pay this all up front. Um, here's what we can do month by month. And this is the date, et cetera, et cetera. And she was like, oh my gosh, yes, that's a great idea. It was like a revelation. And she, we closed the sale. She signed on instantly. The artist didn't have to compromise on the price. We didn't have to compromise on the price and lose the commission that we all worked so hard for. Um, and the client in the end got what they wanted. With that said, uh, if you plan to do this, do not give the artwork to the clients until they've paid at the end of the payment plan. People will completely, that's that's completely standard, that's understandable, and that's how it should be. That's just an FYI. Another story that stands out in my mind is we had a solo show of a local artist, probably in 2018, and she was selling uh, paintings of the series that she had been working on, really excited about at that time. And then a few of those paintings she made into the prints that were, you know, like a lower, a lower price point, more accessible artwork to our point about the price range. And I remember there had been this woman that kept coming into the show, leaving, she kept coming back, always a sign, by the way, when someone is co coming back to your booth or back to your studio or back to your gallery, leaving, coming back, that means they really want something and they just need to be convinced. <laughs> um, so when she finally came back, you know, a second or third time, I was talking to her about herself. You want to be a good listener and learning about her. And then I was telling her about the artist and she was like, well, you know, I think I could just get this print. They're so beautiful. And I was like, yeah, the prints are beautiful. They're high quality prints. I work with the artist on those. She takes a lot of pride in those prints. Um, but, you know, you seem like you're really invested in her as an artist and, you know, her work really resonates with you. Um, how about we do a payment plan and purchase the original painting that this print was derived from and informed by? And she was like, oh my gosh. And there we go again. I was able to upsell 
at a higher price because I had this work in the price range and because I offered this payment plan alternative. And she loved that idea of having this original painting eventually in her home of this print that she loved and thought she had to settle with because of her budget. Then she realized, oh, wow, you're making this more accessible for me. Yes, I want to spend more on the larger piece in a longer time span because in the end, it is worth it. So keep that in mind when you're pricing your own work, artwork and uh, certainly encourage any galleries you're with. If they're not already, they probably are to observe that range and to consider the payment plan. All right. Um, those are the top items to keep in mind or that we keep in mind as gallery owners when we are pricing artwork. Um, and like I said, I also encourage artists to keep a lot of these prints in mind when you're pricing your artwork independently as well. I would love to hear any questions, comments uh, in the chat, or I think we're a small group, Jack, right? So we can just say yep. any comments or questions we might have. Yeah, and I have a bunch of questions. Um, I mean, the first one is like like more logistical, uh, the the price per square inch type of thing versus like like how do you um where do you start when pricing like uh that's a good question i never adhere to any of those formulas because we were working with artists working in so many different media and oftentimes the media was like hybrid so i couldn't go by size as much so I think the starting place is always, like I said, look around, you know, I'm always looking at price lists. I'm always looking at labels. Whenever pricing is transparent, take a look, study it. One. Two, I think looking at the nuts and bolts of like how much you spent on materials for that piece is a good starting place. So it's not like your price is, oh, I spent $500 on those materials. That's going to be my price. That's like a starting point, like a bare minimum. And then from there, you could add like an hourly rate. You know, think about an hourly rate um, for a job that you've been paid for in a freelance capacity. And I think that could translate as well. And then when you have a number there between what you've spent on materials, about how many hours you put into the piece, it's a starting point that then you can. Um, ask other artists about i think that's a that's a really uh underestimated source of information as well you know former uh, artists typically have other artist friends which i and if you don't i always highly recommend that in my other workshops about community so you know speak to artists in your tribe artists that you trust about how they're pricing their artworks and see how it compares to the number that you started with and you will learn a lot from those discussions and and I'll say two things on that. Um, first off, in in pricing research, um, Spring Break Art Fair just happened, and all of their prices are available online. So that's Bingo. To start research, but also for you know for for beginning artists, make sure that your prices are aligned with the artists um, that you're looking at their experience and like if they're showing with a major gallery, their prices Bingo. are higher. Um, if they've been doing it for 30 years, you know, like why are there, why are their prices that way? And so make sure like you're aligned with their experience. And the other thing I'll say is that um, for the cost of creation is often very different from like installation and sculpture yeah. than painting. And so That's right. sculpture especially needs to take that into account is like what you put into it. Exactly. I think those are such great points, Jack. And this, I brought my slide back here about let's keep it real and in perspective. You know, think about where you're showing, where you'd like to go, the artists that you're comparing themselves to, like Jack said, think about where they're showing and where you are in relation to them. Um, looking at spring break, that's brilliant. Like walking through there and looking at the prices, it's so easy. You don't have to ask for a price list. You don't have to have an, an awkward exchange. Just look on the wall or there's a price list or a postcard on the table. 
It's all um, online too. Spring break is all yeah. online. You don't even need Oh, that's to right. It's all online. Exactly. Thank you. That's what you said. It's all online. So look at spring break, look at artsy, you know, do a, especially if you need, let's say you're working with sculpture, because sometimes that can be more challenging. Um, you know, look up sculptors from in, in artsy, like look at different pieces. Um, if you don't know artists that are that are already working in sculpture to start out with and just do a regular sculpture search. And then you can kind of backtrack and see the price ranges for different kinds of sculptures and how they're affiliated with the different tiers of galleries. But yeah, looking online in general is such a great resource, especially to compare because it's really, like I was saying, it's not in a vacuum. People that buy art, people that sell art, and people that could be collectors, that could be gallery owners, that could be other artists. Anyone that's mindful about um, the commercial space is always looking and thinking about pricing. So it will stand out if your pricing is way off, whether that's super low, like too low, or whether that's really high. It it kind of it's like a little alarm, like eh, what's what's going on there. So, and typically that means that the person just didn't, it's not a horrible thing. It just means that they weren't really taking into account their peer group and the market and the broader environment. So talk to people you trust, look online for comps, as they say in real estate, <laughs> um, document your own time, your own expenses, because much like a gallery we're thinking about, right? You saw what I put here with the incidentals. These are like the gallery expenses that we're always thinking about and that sometimes we miss and we learn the hard way. It's the same thing for you as an artist, you know, keep track of those expenses so you know that your pricing will at least cover the bare minimum and then you'll build from there. I just had a chat with a gallerist actually today about um, what's selling and what's not. And she was talking about the consignment price versus the sale price. And the consignment price is what the artist and gallerist are going to split and the sales price is a little bit higher. And she was saying right. it's, it's almost always because somebody will want a discount and yes. be able to price that in and that nobody wants to pay shipping today. And so they're working in the into the sales price um, just because oh, it's like psychologically there. Yeah, and it saves you this uncomfortable discussion where ultimately they'll say, I'm going to buy this, I'm not going to pay the shipping. And so you learn like, you know what, I'm just going to put those costs into the into my pricing model. That's right. And just avoid that conversation and know that myself and the artists are covered. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see a question in the chat. Um, let's see, Jack, one moment. Mm -hmm. Sid Gottlieb. Hi, Sid. I'm going to read Sid's question or comment here. I have a few. Firstly, when selling out of state as an artist, would you try to factor in the other state's tax for the buyer or let them handle it accordingly? Typically, I only include my state sales tax for my own tax purposes or maybe a neighboring state since it is my understanding that is ultimately the buyer's responsibility to declare or pay on the piece. I do note this. Oh my gosh, I remember dealing with this with the art fairs. It was like, oh my gosh, you do have to take it into account. I'm trying to remember there was a story where we priced something to someone that was being shipped out of state. And there was like a choice that we made on the floor as to whether we'd pay for her shipping or her tax. <laughs> It's been too long. I have to get back to you about those um, those specifics. But I would say yes. Be proactive if you're doing out of state um, sales and research what what those terms are, because you don't want that to come back and bite you in any way. Um, I'd have to know the specific context. Oh, nice. Looks like Amy put something in the in the chat there. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Would you try to factor in the other states' tax? Yeah. I would definitely try to factor in the other sales tax because sometimes you have to. Like, this is also why it's helpful. We had and still have a bookkeeper and an accountant. So, if you can also connect with someone like that, it could sometimes be a pro bono service. 
uh, that works with artists. Sometimes artists, and I actually know one, um, as you know, many artists are multi-talented and do a range of different um, jobs outside of the art world. So our bookkeeper at the gallery that is still our bookkeeper is an artist herself. Um, and she's also an excellent bookkeeper. So I just used to go to her and still do for hairy tax questions. And then if she's kind of stumped, she'll go to our accountant. So yes, do your research, Google, um, learn those tax laws in whatever state you're participating in because um, it's just more information is power. And then try to find a good uh, small business or artist bookkeeper or accountant and have that in your back pocket. All right, I see another message here. Yes, Amy, exactly. Amy says there's typically a threshold for out of state sales tax, exactly. So you wanna look at that. Again, pricing comes into play there. Like how expensive is your piece? I think it was something like under $600 um, is not taxed in New York or there was some, yes, thank you for reminding me. That threshold is important. Okay, Sid's question, thank you. Another question concerns investment into the piece. Since I'm not represented by a gallery, it often lands on me to frame the work. And then that cost is subtracted from my percentage of the sale. Is there anything to do about this with the dealer when negotiating participation in a show? Yes. Ask them. I had artists ask me, could you help with the framing cost? And if we could, if we could um, help entirely, we would do that. If we couldn't, we'd be honest and say, you know what, we can't take on the framing cost, the entire framing cost but let's meet you halfway. We can we can cover half of the framing cost. Let's go half and half. And that helps everyone, right? There's no need for just the artist or just the gallery to shoulder the burden if you legitimately can't do it. Also, galleries, I still have a great relationship with my framer from back in the day. So galleries do have relationships with a lot of these vendors and are able to get kind of wholesale rates or discounts, friends and family rates, because we're always bringing them business. So I think it is really smart to talk to your dealer or your gallery um, and say, hey, you know, can you help out with the framing? Can you get an estimate? Do you have a framer that you have a good relationship? It helps in a lot of ways because not only is there that um, discount, that price incentive because of the relationship, but also the trust is there. You know you're going to be sending your work to a vendor that the gallery trusts. and um, there'll be less chance of any drama or or damage. So yes, you should definitely mention that, you know, framing cost is prohibitive. What can we do? What's your policy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And like I was saying, uh, Sid, is it a case where the piece has to be framed with a lot of your work? Because you could offer an unframed and a frame price, but if it has to be framed, yes, there's no harm in talking to the gallery or the dealer, especially if they're really dying to show that piece, you know. The piece is reframed. We're like, let's do something to make this happen because this show cannot go on without this piece. <laughs> what do you think about raising prices? Um, because it feels like as we go on, we feel the need to raise prices and collectors would want you to raise prices, but yes. if you don't really have a market, um, it's, right. it's hard to, you know, like right. pressing out your, your market. So how do you balance? Exactly. Exactly. That's a really good point. Um, or I want to follow up on that. For yeah. You. What about how you adjust your prices? Maybe like once you have representation in a gallery? Or like how that works, so just like thinking about how your price structure should change. Exactly with that. Yeah. So two things. First, I think you want to start making sales before you raise your prices or before you raise them too much. Like start to have a little track record. That doesn't have to be 20 sales, but you want to have some kind of momentum because that's instructive. It shows you that you've hit that sweet spot that I talked about. It shows you there is, you know, some real appreciation in a monetary commercial sense for the work. And 
you can tell people my work is selling at this price. It's easy to defend that. Once you've had it, you know, you'll have to think of that metric, but once you've had this momentum of sales, um, I had artists tell me they had to raise prices to kind of slow down production because they were selling um, a lot of pieces that took a lot of time. So it was like, let me just raise the price a bit just to kind of slow down that momentum, not lose too many clients, um, but just kind of slow things down and have some more control over their input and their output and their production. So let those sales and that momentum be the um, driver to raising prices. I guess you're definitely going to raise. Oh, sorry, Jack. It's just most artists have the opposite problem. They're not, they're not selling that much, but they feel like they should be raising prices because of their experience keeps growing, and their. Um, you know, yes, that makes sense because experience is another barometer. I would just say not raising it incre. I, I would say raising it incrementally. Yeah. If you're not selling, you don't want to keep raising prices and continue to distance yourself from a market you haven't even really established. That's the that's the problem there. So I really don't believe in raising prices for the sake of raising prices. Like something has to justify it because you're going to have to justify that. People are going to ask you questions. You're going to have to feel confident on the floor explaining yourself. And typically that confidence comes from having made a few sales in a row. I mean, it could be three or four, you know? or from um, gaining more experience and saying, oh yes, well, I had these shows at this particular place, or I had a residency here. Um, I was written up in this paper. Um, I showed with this gallery or this particular artist. I was selected for this prize. Most definitely, those are um, indicators to raise your price in like an incremental way because you can say, yeah, my price was then at was that was was at that point then, but look what's happened. Here is what I have accomplished in the interim. And you so also even touched, if it's sales, you want some some other metrics. You also touched on it earlier about the idea of uh, um, different price points too. So like you could have different series be at different price points. A exactly. Lot of artists, like especially in two dimensional. They'll have a price point like a, a big, big work. So like um, I've heard it called like the hero size. That's like 40 by 60. And there you go. Like above someone's couch or something that could be exactly like the big work, but then smaller works. And then something that's very affordable and entry level, like a print um, or small drawings that's like under a thousand. So you could have most artists can have like a 10,000, uh, you know, a four to 2,000 and then uh, under 1,000 range. Um, I think it's it's so smart and I highly recommend it. Um, the, only, yeah. the only question I have about that is like presentation. Like it seems sort of straight, like presenting those together seems awkward sometimes. No, that's a great point. And that's where curation comes in and the art of selection, exactly. No, that's true. Um, Especially like the lowest end, you know, like yes. the prints or the jacques or something like that seems like, like they just don't seem like they fit in a lot of gallery situations. Right, right. Um, I think they can fit if you are showing different sizes of work, like maybe you can't have the loose prints right that are like in a print stand maybe that is a bit too or just doesn't fit with your larger paintings on the wall but I think if you have a show it can still be comprehensive if you're working with um different sizes of works which can be shown beautifully and not look busy or cheesy it's just different sizes because not everyone can have like a large piece and by default, the pricing will be different there. So it doesn't always have to be like this loose print or um, again, and if you don't, if for some reason your body of work doesn't speak to that and is larger pieces all around, 
that's when I think you implement the payment plan concept if you want to sell. You know, if you're in a context, if you're in a context with buyers who are used to those higher price points, then you're good, right? You don't want to, you also don't want to be in an environment where there are people there who are used to buying $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 work. You want to bring your best, you know, your best, most ambitious self and work to those contexts. So I'm also not saying don't dumb it down, but it's like a, it's like a read the room. Because it's, you're just not going to sell. And if it's okay for you not to sell or that gallery doesn't want to sell, um, that's a whole different calculus. But if the gallery wants to sell or needs to sell and you want to sell, then you really have to bring work that speaks to that gallery, that speaks to that clientele. And sometimes it is going to be work um, that's less expensive and you can find ways to present that. Like my artist got so creative with things like that. Um, I remember Tammy Wynn had her first solo show with us in 2017. Mm -hmm. Now she's with Layman Maupin and she was doing little um, like woodcuts that she signed and she was selling to artist friends for 25 bucks at the opening. And it was like, this is just available at the opening. You know, after the opening, no more $25 cuts. And then she also had these massive, beautiful, complex paintings that at that time were $5,000, $7,500. That was like our higher end. We just had like two of those. And then we had her smaller paintings and prints framed. A selection of maybe six, you know, it wasn't crowded. But we had literally $25 woodblock prints. We had framed prints and paintings that were... I don't know, between 500 and, and 2000, let's say. And then these two big bang paintings that were 5,000 and 7,500. And, you know, we didn't end up selling those at that show. We came close to selling one, we came close. Um, but we sold like a couple of the mid-tier prints and of course a bunch of the little wood blocks. And it was like, cool, like now you have this list of people who bought your work. And then now she's at, you know, a super high-end gallery. So there's ways that you can present yourself in an authentic fashion and provide that range without um, sacrificing your integrity or the aesthetic, the overall aesthetic of the show. I also want to talk for a minute about, um, about the idea of signaling value of artwork because artwork, like buyers, and this has to do with pricing, like buyers, um, especially in America, don't necessarily value artwork. <laughs> um, or right. Artwork. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to cultivate those buyers, sometimes even for the $200 piece. You said it. And That's so, a really great point, so, especially so, art. Um, art. Exactly. And so here are some like aspects that I think about a lot. So like there's scarcity. There's like showing that like, oh, well, there's only limited amounts of these. There's materials that you use. So like typing the materials, I know like Damien Hurst made like a diamond skull, which like we're not doing, but like he was yeah. like, it was part of like the materiality of it is what increased its value for people. That's right. That's um, but right. Also for younger artists, like how you treat your artwork and how you behave around it. So like if your artwork is strewn across, across the floor, other and like you're stepping on it, other people won't value it as highly. That's so true. Like package That's so true. it like a like a $5,000 piece, like it should be packaged also so that it's uh, other people, you know, it's, it's signaling, it's showing people valuable. It and sure it's, is. And you're, you're it. exactly, yeah. it really is. It's like how you put it out there, how you talk about it. Um, you're educating people about your practice, which by extension is educating them about contemporary art and, and why they should value it and pay for it. Um, that is a large part of this. We remember thinking like, oh, we're this super accessible neighborhood gallery. Why do people still feel intimidated, you know, when they walk in here and some people don't want to make eye contact. Some people run in and walk, run out. Like we're here for you. We're in the neighborhood. And we had to keep reminding ourselves like, yes, that's who we are. And those are our values. But there is still this ingrained perception about galleries and artwork and contemporary art and it's not accessible. And so we were constantly um, battling that and trying to counter that. And we were always trying to do um, 
interactive events with our artists. We were doing, you know, conversations, salons, um, to really make people feel ownership and, and value the work so that, you know, so that we could sell it. Selling really isn't pricing. It's, it's all part of an education for you and, and for the buyer. You learn a lot in the process. Um, I remember an artist who has since moved to California. Do you know Rhea Hurt, Jack? Or know of Rhea Hurt? So she does these magnificent, um, really ethereal, like shimmery paintings in like fluid organic shapes. And for her solo show opening, she made about 20 or 25 small versions of those in little wood boxes. And it was literally like for the first uh, 20 people who showed up, you would get one of those signed small paintings in the wood blocks. And that just brought people into the space. She was giving it away for free, but it wasn't cheesy and it wasn't, it was very much who she was, like just like someone who's very generous and wants to invite people into her practice and make people feel comfortable around art. So she literally made those beautiful paintings, signed them, kept a log of contact information of who um, she gifted each piece to, and then she built this client list. So they didn't technically buy her work that day, but she had 20 new clients who were like, or potential clients, who were like, ooh, if I'm one of the first people there, I'll get this, I'll get to meet the artist. You know, she lured them in. And that was one of her best-selling shows, you know? So not just at the opening, but during the exhibition and then after the exhibition as well, the follow-up, we were making more sales. So it doesn't have to be an either-or with like selling lower-priced or even giving away work versus the more expensive, um, you know, larger pieces, let's say you can create accessibility and that range in an authentic way. It just takes some, you know, some strategizing and some creative thinking. And uh, Amy asks, what third party did you use for payment plans? Or do you have any ideas on that? Oh my gosh, who was that? Let's see. Let's see if I can find them. I don't remember the name now. I'm gonna do a quick search. I know I did one where I just got a check in, like it was personal. It was someone in the neighborhood and I would get a check every month for a year. It was pretty nice. And did you have a little contract or was it like you trusted them enough where you probably had a little contract and I kept track of every check that I got. So it wasn't, there we go. You know, exactly. It can be that simple. And you, you, I remember we'd pick a day for them to pay this particular company. Yes, Amy, it's art money. Does that sound familiar? They were excellent. Art, money, two words. They were based out of um, Australia. Haven't worked with them in a while, but when I did, they were they were just starting up at that time. They were excellent. And our clients enjoyed working with them too. Thank you for that, because it forced me to figure out who that, remember who that was. <laughs> okay. um, we're, coming, we're, we're about over six. Does anyone else have any last minute questions? Last chance, going once. It is going twice. Did yeah. you touch on the question about what happens when you, how prices should shift when you join a gallery? Oh, thank you. Yes, we started talking studio. about some other things. Yeah. Yes, yeah. most definitely. So that goes back to the conversation with the gallery owner. They will definitely advise you. Your prices will definitely go up, and that is completely justifiable and um, expected. And the gallery will inform you about who their clientele is, what their sales are like. They'll be very upfront about what they can do, what they expect to do. Um, when they go to your studio or work with you to select the work, they will be thinking about, um, as I used to, like, what do I like? What do I think will sell? Find some balance there. It often wasn't a conflict. What I liked often would sell. Sometimes things that I didn't think would sell, like certain challenging sculptures were the first things out the door. So you learn every time, but that is really in partnership with the gallery. Your price will go up. They will tell you how much. And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised with the answer <laughs> because they have clientele. It's not you trying to build your own. That's always important. That can't hurt. Everyone loves new buyers, but the gallery has their people. The gallery has their clientele. 
it's our job to go out there constantly cultivating, informing, building new clientele. That's what we spend a lot of our money on. So we will tell you for this genre, this body of work, where you are now, this is what we're going to do, you know, and then you, you, you talk about it and then you come to, a, come but to I, an agreement. I haven't experienced it. This isn't Ruth's question, but uh, this is about that clientele issue and pricing. I haven't experienced it personally, but I've heard that uh, some clients only want to spend like above 20,000, whereas other clients, you know, only want to spend right. below a thousand. So um, that's where having different ranges in your artwork is important because some, you know, there are some, some people out there that only want to spend the big bucks. That's right. Cause they, for them and their collection and where they're at, Exactly. They think, okay, this artist has, you know, been vetted and has checked a bunch of boxes to get to this point, And this is where I'm coming in, you know, whereas other people are like, oh, I want to support the emerging artists who and kind of grow with them and see how they develop. And that's a different price point and a different type of buyer too. There's a buyer for the everyone. Is, so I think the range, you just can't hurt with the range. All right. Well, thank you so much, Krista. Thank you for joining. Thank and you, everyone. Remember to check out our other free resources at uh, creativelattice.com. And uh, we will see you at the next session. Thank you so much.